So it is my great pleasure to welcome back Norman Sue. Norman is a UCI PhD alum, uh, and I had the great pleasure of working with Norman. I, I was his advisor, and we, we had a lot of fun. So um, Norman, quick background, uh, he did his bachelor's at Berkeley in computer science. Then he came here to informatics, did his PhD. Then he went off to Dublin and uh, lived in Ireland, I think it was two years? Three years. Three years. Three years. And then came back to the U.S. to be at Indiana as a faculty member. So um, Norman's done a range of different kinds of work. Uh, as For his dissertation, he did something which I love. It's called T-pattern analysis, which is really a co very complicated analysis. And I was so impressed that he learned it on his own. This is not something that people learn on their own. And he used that to understand people's patterns of activity when they, when they do information work. Um, more recently, he's moved on, and he's uh, going to talk about uh, a different topic. Uh, and I do want to say a fun fact. Uh, Norman is a musician. He plays piano, and he plays Irish flute. <laughs> uh, thanks for the wonderful uh, introduction, Gloria. Um, it's great to be back here. I think it's been maybe five years since the last time I was here, maybe for the ICE, ICE conference was the last time I was in Irvine. And um, yeah, before I came here, I, I kind of visited my old haunts and uh, noticed a few things different, a few things are the same, maybe a, a few more Starbucks, but a lot more students, so um, I think it's a, it's a good thing. And, uh, I, I love my time here, and uh, I always remember talking to other recently graduate PhD students. They always say, like, remember your PhD time. It's one of the best times of your lives, even though you might not think it now. But uh, now I actually think back on it. It's, it's one of the, the greatest times of my lives, and I, I really cherish it. Okay, um, so today um, I'm going to be talking about um, our efforts to sort of merge humanities with the empirical to learn and design for our subcultures. So uh, with students and collaborators in my Authentic User Experience Lab, uh, we study opportunities to design from and design with uh, subcultures. And in this talk, I'm going to use uh, this following notion of subcultures. So first, uh, subcultures can be considered a subgroup with practices that are outside but not necessarily in opposition to the mainstream. And another characteristic um, that I find about subcultures interesting is that they really have these sort of strong traditions, customs, and values that form the basis of their identity. So I'm going to be using sort of this uh, broad uh, definition of subcultures here. <clears throat> so our group uh, designs a consideration of the values and practices of different subcultures uh, that often intersect with different domains of life. So domestic, uh, professional, religious, leisure, health, and more recently in rural domains of contemporary life. So in addition to those subcultures, today I'm going to just dive straight into how we approach design with two subcultures that I've had uh, sort of sustained engagement with. Uh, one is on Irish traditional musicians. I sort of alluded to Gloria with my Irish flute playing. Mm -hmm. And then another is on Midwest hunters. <clears throat> so uh, what do Irish traditional musicians do? So they play music together in sessions. They gather together in like a pub, a public space, like a restaurant. And uh, it's an oral tradition with no uh, sheet music. And so they gather together. And uh, I'll just play a quick clip of what, what it looks like. So uh, repetition is very much key in Irish session. So they'll play tunes several times over and over again. And then uh, like this next tune, which is called the Sky Skylark Reel, is going to probably be played three times more until the next uh, tune is played again. So musicians play reels, jigs, and hornpipes. Those are the traditional tunes. So here, uh, my interest in this site really was in examining design opportunities for a subculture that's very concerned with how music is passed on from generation to generation. So sort of in line with CSCW's theoretical uh, history with representation, concerns about representation, I want to see how folk music is or might be captured through computerized representations. <laughs> So through a sort of two-year ethnography learning and uh, becoming a trad musician, I actually found 
that a, a literary theory was useful for talking about what it is that traditional musicians do. Um, so it offers a useful lens to understand representation as a creative process with pervasive technology. So the theory I'm going to use is one from the Constant School of Literary Criticism. It's called Reader Reception Theory here. So the basic idea is that you have sort of these three actors, if you will. You have uh, the reader, someone that is maybe consuming an art piece. You have the text, which you can think of as the art piece itself. And beneath that is the creator of that art piece, the person who made it, the artist. And reader reception theory um, offers a new way to understand how is it that valuable pieces of text come to be? How does a value work or a uh, uh, literary work come into existence? And it emphasizes that it really is the interaction between the reader and the text that creates this valuable work. So the implication here is that every time I read or look at a piece of art, for example, or read a book, a new piece of work comes into being, right? And so uh, there's this interaction between the two pieces and the reader themselves has a lot of agency and responsibility for making something valuable, not just the artist, which is traditionally emphasized here. <clears throat> so uh, the reader reception theory, also called the aesthetics of reception, implies uh, that there needs to be work done on two fronts. So to produce valuable work, you have to have first a creative text that defies the reader's expectations, and then you need an imaginative reader, someone that knows about previous literary patterns and with their social and historical context and can recognize when something is valuable. So for the, there's this tension between having expectations and the feeling that they'll probably be violated. So just an example, um, you know, good fiction has to balance between presenting merely an illusion uh, where we imagine ourselves in a purely unrealistic world. So a canonical example might be trashy romance novels, mm -hmm. right? And on the other hand, we don't want fiction to merely restate what we already know. So maybe a novel on just about uh, vacuuming rooms might not be interesting, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, there's exceptions, mm -hmm. right? So one text is capable of many different realizations, and no reading can fully exhaust that potential here. So a key finding from the ethnography with traditional musicians is that the concept of the tune, music here, can be described in terms of three sort of central processes, learning, knowing, and retaining, and all of which uh, involve the production of value art, and that is the interaction between the text and the musician. Okay? So let me go into more detail about what I mean by this. <coughs> So when Irish traditional musicians learn music, or they try to you know, learn a tune, what they're actually talking about often is finding the right text to build their literary work on. So the tune itself is just a skeleton from which uh, to build upon their own interpretation, but they need to find that right text. So sometimes that's orally uh, consumed, so uh, repeated exposure at a session, hearing that tune over and over, um, sometimes going to YouTube videos, uh, there's a lot of databases out there now on the internet that have uh, uh, transcriptions of folk music as well. So you might go there to <coughs> the right text. <clears throat> and Irish traditional musicians also, when you talk about do you know a tune, actually most musicians might know have incomplete knowledge of the tune because it's a collaborative effort to play a tune. Right? So uh, most musicians know, you know thousands of tunes. Uh, there's no sheet music. But uh, they might not know it. You might not, they might not be able to play it as a solo piece, right? So they can start the piece, know 50%, and you're kind of hoping other people might fill in the gap of that tune. And collaboratively, they'll be able to reconstruct that tune together. And finally, uh, how is it that the musicians retain these tunes, right? And that is uh, due to a hook into their memory. So what's really interesting is that musicians have know a lot about the stories behind the tune. So they'll know, for example, who was the composer, why was it composed, you know, what does the name mean? And so um, one of the tunes um, that's often talked about is The Haunted House, right? So what, why is it called The Haunted House? Um, is it something about where the piece was composed, for example, right? The style or where you learned it or the style of that player is another thing. Um, so for myself, for example, to sometimes something that will help me recall a tune is that this was learned from my teacher, or I learned that someone showed me that tune at a birthday party. Those are hooks into the memory that help me recall that tune. <clears throat> so to become a folk musician, you really need to actually have an understanding of tunes, 
that are in concert with the values of tradition. So tunes have to be non-authoritative, speak of their provenance, uh, have to be experienced in the session, and like I said, in one text there's many tunes possible, and they're collaboratively played. But our findings actually show that digital texts, so for example, sheet music online, or YouTube clips, uh, which newcomers are often comfortable accessing, often rely on, don't adequately represent or even misrepresent tunes. So, you know, if you look up on, on a website, um, the sheet music there gives off an air of uh, authority that that transcription is the correct transcription of that tune. Uh, many of these tunes don't say anything about the provenance of the tune, where it comes from, um, where it might have been heard. And uh, the, the, these transcriptions often represent to very minute detail certain variations on the tunes that most musicians would leave out in the text. And it supports more of a solitary way of learning tunes. So these uh, kind of digital texts don't fit with the values of traditional music here. And really the tunes, the, the authoritative, the authentic way of learning tunes, sort of matches with what I would call the canonical values of this subculture, right? So uh, it's all about oral learning, flexible representation, historical respect, foregrounding the social over the lo and the local, and sort of balancing individuality with the group. So what we uh, got partly from the findings was trying to think about how is it that um, a novice musician would be able to understand a very nuanced and complex notion of learning tunes, right? So if you go to a session, a local session, they have their own repertoire of knowing thousands of tunes. How are you going to join that session, right? So we thought, okay, maybe there's a design opportunity here uh, to create a system that would help one uh, understand the history of tune playing practices in a session, right? To visualize that and help them get a jump start. So we uh, designed a system called Tune Tracker and deployed it in probably the most the foremost uh, pub for Irish music in Dublin called the Cobblestone Pub in Dublin. Anyone have been to Dublin or Cobblestone? Okay. Um, so uh, the, uh, the proprietor of the pub actually comes from a long line of Irish pipers as well, so a uh, long history of traditional music here. So we developed this system, and if you know Shazam, it's basically like a Shazam, but for Irish traditional music, okay, that's always running in the pub here. So we put the system up in the corner of this pub and had this microphone pointing down at this nook where the Irish uh, traditional musicians were playing here. So it would recognize the tunes, um, match it up with the existing corpus, and would post the names of the tunes on a website. So just to give you an idea of what the interface looked like. Um, basically, you could go to this website here, Tune Tracker, and then you could see a running list of the tunes that have been played. So on Sunday, you know, November 10th, you could see that uh, within a mile of Dublin Reel was played around 2 p.m., right? And then that was followed by O'Connell's trip to Parliament. You can click on a transcription of it or look at statistics about it. Perhaps what's more useful is that you can see trends. So we had the system running for a while, and you could see, for example, what are the top 100 tunes played across all Monday sessions? Because every night is led by a different uh, group of musicians. So if I want to join a Monday session, I might think to myself, okay, maybe I should learn the Lilting Banshee jig because that seems, seems to be one that's played pretty common, and if I play that <coughs> tune, there's a, good if I, there's a good chance I could join in when they play that tune, right? Because uh, the trend show is played often. So we deployed the system for almost a year, and actually um, we found that despite what we thought was a very deep ethnographic work, we engaged with community partners, with the pub owner, uh, we advertised, we sent flyers about it, and ensured everyone about their privacy. It was an extremely controversial system. Okay. And I actually heard that um, um, by the time I left Dublin, I had some master students helping to maintain it. They, were t they told me that some musicians were protesting and going to the back of the pub so that they would not be uh, um, within the tune tracker's uh, audio range to recognize the tunes. Right. So um, the, when we interviewed people about why they felt this way about the system, um, we saw that there are very divergent views between amateurs and professional uh, Irish traditional musicians. So despite the fact that I, would, I think it's relatively unproblematic that most trad musicians would say our subculture is about oral learning, flexible representation, you know, it's about social uh, activities, it's about historical respect, uh, it was a very divisive system. So professionals, for example, were very much worried because the Cobblestone Pub was so famous 
that would become a, a representation of how Irish traditional music should be played. And that people would go to that website and say, okay, we should be playing their tunes because they're the ones that really know Irish traditional music, right? We gotta go to the source. Um, other musicians were worried it would create what they call tune monsters, right? So people would print out the list of tunes and come to the session and expect people to follow that sequence of tunes, right? And if they deviated from that, they would question them. Um, and uh, for many musicians, they thought that this was really a, a pub, was a, a locally public space, but not globally public, right? It should be private from a global sense. And some interesting things was the way musicians thought they owned the tunes in some ways, like having ownership. So the tunes are maybe hundreds of years old, right? So there's no composer name attached to it. But uh, the stringing of sequences of tunes one after another into a set was thought to be a creative endeavor, right? So if someone was playing around with sets, deciding what tunes go well together, they're worried that someone could go to the website and just snatch uh, years of effort in making that set, right? Maybe record an album or something, right? So they lose that ownership of those sets. Um, but we found like amateurs and indeed some professionals liked the system. They thought, okay, this is good. I can reflect on statistics of the tunes being played in the session. I could see uh, one uh, musician, uh, she was from Kerry in, India, uh, in Ireland, and they play a lot of polkas there. And she said, okay, our session only plays 10% polkas. And she's saying, I want to represent my dialect, my region more, so we should be playing more uh, polkas in our session. Um, they thought it would foster a new generation, you know, uh, supports that egalitarian spirit of sessions, and supports that even globally you can hand over tunes and pass it from generation to generation. So after one year, we dismantled the system, right? So the, the owner was always supportive, but we were always worried that uh, he would lose business or there would be more protests. So we eventually decided to dismantle the system. And it led me to really think about like what went wrong, right? Or you know, it's a success or a failure. What, what, what is the right way to measure this? And is there a way to go beyond just saying people have different views, right? And so who do we design for which person? The amateur, the professional, only one? Um, these are sort of questions that we kind of turn to. And so when kind of thinking about these seemingly intractable differences, I actually found turning to philosophy was <coughs> helpful here. So uh, it described very well some of the reactions I was observing and hearing to the tune tracker system. And it, it's because I think philosophy is sort of concerned about, in some ways, framing understanding of users. So philosophy thinks hard about questions of ethics and morality and delimiting, for example, what are the kinds of lives that are available to us and what should we choose. And actually the very way that philosophy is written by philosophers is often written obviously to convince a reader, right, or point them to a certain way of thinking. And I, I think um, thinking about uh, the writing strategies of philosophy as a way to inform design could be something interesting as well to deal with, for example, the divisive discourse we encounter. So I'm going to talk about one way that we sort of, if you will, sort of reimagine ethnographic investigations into a, a philosophical framework. And so I'm going to be drawing from uh, Soren Kierkegaard. So he's arguably the first uh, existentialist philosopher. Anyone read Soren Kierkegaard maybe as a, in a philosophy class? Or? OK, Gloria has read a little bit. OK. So basically what uh, Kierkegaard was interested in was the question of, how do you fulfill humanity's uh, potential? And what he did was he listed out three ways, possibilities of living, and he called these spheres of existence. So aesthetic, ethical, and religious were the three different spheres, and he delimited how you should live. <clears throat> so this theory of different ways of living is interesting too, but it's also interesting how he conveyed these different spheres of existence. He didn't just write them out. What he actually did was use a technique called indirect communication. So if you pick up any of his major writings, um, he, it doesn't show Kierkegaard as the author of the piece, right? Uh, it shows some, uh, uh, there's a pseudonym of a fi fictional author, and there's often these elaborate stories in the preface how the text that's being published was found in a secret compartment in a desk that I found. I found all these papers, and so I'm going to publish them and let you as a reader decide what to think about it. Right? So the reason Kierkegaard does that is that he wants to present these stories or different ways of living. So the author, Judge Willing, for example, uh, espouses the ethical way of living. So he's going to talk about it and its strengths and weaknesses. And then you have to decide yourself if you are persuaded by that person's argument. 
and not think that you want to agree with that because Kierkegaard, a famous philosopher, said that. Okay, so that was the technique that he did, a design, if you will, of trying to explain philosophy here. So I'm going to just quickly go over two ways of, of living authentically as an Irish musician, again, reimagine the ethnographic work, but I, I'm not going to go into the religious sphere because due to <coughs> just the first two here. Okay, so the aesthetic musician uh, lives for immediate pleasure and he pr pr prides himself in being able to enjoy music without commitment. And so the world is his playground to experiment. Uh, the, the aesthetic musician is an adept user of tune tracker. He knows everything about sessions instantly. He knows what tunes to practice beforehand. He's competent to become a visible member of any Irish session. He'll never be left out, and he revels in the thrill playing together. His immediate grasp of the session wows spectators. Though his ability to play together with strangers gives him joy, he also seeks to play his own tunes. So he wants to be in the spotlight, playing virtuosic, unusual tunes that will impress, yet few of his fellow players will play together with him. So one of the weaknesses of the aesthetic musician is that he will quickly become bored, jumping from one session to another without establishing or understanding a history with local musicians in pubs. So Tune Tracker can be seen as a great leveler. It puts all participants of the session on the same level. It compresses the session into a nameless list of tunes. Uh, sessions will lose their individuality. So in contrast, the ethical musician is willing to sacrifice his immediate desire to play as many tunes as possible, to find his place in tradition, and to give music its proper profundity as a socially situated practice with a rich local history. So here, tradition sort of dictates toughing it out. So the ethical musician has to sit in a session, maybe content with not playing, and he seeks to understand the history of tunes and their significance to a session and players. He's not just a tourist going from one pub to another finding the right session. <clears throat> the ethical musician values the playing of old masters. He utilizes sources on the internet to find how such masters have interpreted tunes. Tune Tracker as a tool supports the egalitarian spirit of traditional music and provides a pathway by which musicians from different countries and skill levels can join sessions and respect tradition. So these are just sort of reimaginings of how we might think about two different kinds of ways of living in terms of Irish traditional musicians. And now we can think about how might design support these ways of living. And we can think about what does it mean, for example, to think about uh, indirectly communicating these ways of living through Tune Tracker. So in one sense, we can imagine that the Tune Tracker as it exists, as we originally developed, already supports an aesthetic musician, right? It gives immediate pleasure back. Uh, it lets me know immediately the statistics of what are the most common tunes played, and so I can go there and learn that tune and play immediately. I can jump from session to session and see which is the right session for me. <clears throat> so what would sort of an ethical mode of the indirect tune tracker look like, right? So one way to think about this, if you want to be part of the proper history and engage with the local musicians, uh, a simple design change there might be to require the player, for example, to get a password from a local player to access Tune Tracker's records, right? Or require that the musician add provenance information to tunes on that system. So this helps to affirm that sessions are locally public but globally private here. So this is a sort of way of thinking about design in terms of this philosophical framework and through indirect communication is something we're calling designing for authenticity here. And our purpose here is not to make designs that are specific to different spheres of existence, like, oh, we should make designs just for this aesthetic kind of musician. Um, rather, it's that each user needs to be exposed to all different spheres with their strengths and weaknesses, and then they have to decide on themselves which is the right way to live. So the musician will be exposed to an indirect tune tracker for the ethical mode, and as well as the aesthetic mode, and then they'll decide, okay, which is the right way for me to do music supported by this system here. And the hope here is that empathy happens when one is forced to act as another user would here. Okay, so some of your Irish tradition musicians, I'm going to do immediately switch here to talk about another subculture that actually has a lot of divisive opinions as well. So particularly when I moved to Indiana, I, I found hunting is really a big, large part of rural culture here. Does anyone do hunting here or engage in hunting? No one here? Okay, see someone in the back there? Okay. 
So uh, the purpose of this work here was really to problematize what does it mean to be a user of nature here. And um, I, I want to talk about how a certain kind of user of nature does work within a codified, uh, unified ethos uh, or mantra here. But despite these, again, canonical values, when you start digging deeper into here, you start to see a wide range of oppositional values, practices, knowledge, and artifacts from these different social worlds here. So this work was based on a two-year ethnography of hunters. <clears throat> so the sort of moral compass when hunting bases itself on is uh, pretty, pretty unproblematically called fair chase. Okay, so this is the idea that um, fair chase is the ethical, sportsmanlike, and lawful pursuit and taking of game uh, that doesn't give the hunter an improper advantage over such animals here. So what does this mean in practice? It means that uh, hunters always have to ensure that there is a challenge with the animal, so you don't cheat the animal here. So this really requires that you have a really deep understanding of the skill of game, right? So for example, it means having to know that deer have poor eyesight but very good sense of smell, whereas turkeys are actually the opposite. So they have really good eyesight but a really poor sense of smell. And so the strategies that you use, the artifacts and technology you use are going to be different for each of those cases. Uh, another part of this is respecting the harvest of animals, and harvest is really just another word for shooting, tracking, gutting, and transportation of the animal. And hunting is really about being uh, submerged in nature, experiencing nature viscerally, and having skills honed from growing up in the country, so what uh, Desmond calls country competence here. And here I'm going to kind of use a, a little bit about uh, Hegel's notion of the dialectic here. So the basic idea here, I, I can't compress it in a, a few sentences, but basically is that there's a sense that there's always this unity here together, but it always gives away to disunity and comes back to unity <coughs> here. And the reason I use this here is because hunters, when they talk about what is the right way to do hunting, uh, especially in terms of technology, uh, they always talk about in opposition to practices that are not correct. So there's always a dialectic between them versus other hunters. And I think that's a useful way to think about how they think about their values and practices here. I'm going to talk about two, two sorts of dialectics here. Uh, one is the hunt and one is the lay of the land. So in the hunt, we'll see here that weapon choice actually embodies very particular practices of fair chase. And harvesting the animal ethically is always juxtaposed against other hunters who do it differently. And in the lay of the land, it really is about trying to understand the interaction between species behavior and the land. And again, here it's trying to set the opposition of what are authentic ways to understand this interaction, what are the inauthentic ways to do that. So with the hunt, uh, there's a dialectic between bow hunters and other hunters who use weapons like rifles. And so um, bow hunters gravitate towards that sort of weapon to use in hunting because they feel that to ensure fair chase, uh, what you need to do is have a more embodied action with the artifacts that you're doing, so pulling up the bow out like that. Uh, there's a higher skill requirement, and you have to have, uh, get much closer to the animal to harvest it. Um, so here one hunter says that it's, it's no big trick to shoot a deer at 150 yards with a gun, right? And now you, with a bow and arrow, you have to actually go 50 you know, yards right off. And again, there's that embody action of drawing it back and uh, a much increased rate of failure when hunting with a bow. And this dialectic is particularly uh, present against uh, new regulations in Indiana that allow high-powered rifles in hunting season. Right, so these allow almost like a sniper-like way of shooting animals. So uh, bow hunters complain that it's not right if you're shooting an animal that doesn't have a clue that you're even in the same country, right? Versus getting close to them and having that greater chance of error happening here, a greater chance of a challenge. Another very interesting thing about bow hunting season, so in hunting that is typically broken up into different seasons, um, is that bow hunting season is kind of mashed up together or seen as equivalent to uh, cross bow hunting season. So they just put them all together. And bow hunters uh, very much dislike the notion that crossbows are the same as bow hunting. And they see the crossbow essentially as a cross gun, what they call it. And you know, with a crossbow, you see deer coming, uh, you put a telescopic sight on it, you know, you kind of pull the bolt back, and then you shoot it like a gun. That's the only movement. So you lose that embodied interaction with the bow and arrow. Um, and this, um, putting the bow hunting and cross 
bow hunting season all in together kind of misidentifies the ethics, right? It conflates the fact that the that um, they're both the same when they think they're not. And I think what's interesting is, in hunting at least, is that you know with these hunting seasons, it actually creates different worlds of hunting and a different environment. So when you have an environment where in, in rifle hunting season, everyone else is using rifles around you, right? So you might hunt in a group, you know, or just sol solo, but you're aware of other hunters around you. And in that environment, uh, especially bull hunters, they feel like you have all these reckless gun users. We don't pay attention to what's shooting, uh, what they're shooting behind that. So you know they want, they need to wear that orange vest to be careful. But in the world of bow hunting, the world of hunting is transformed. Right, you go out in nature. There's less people in the woods, less sp spooking in the game, and less intrusiveness here. Another dialectic uh, theme here is the lay of the land, and increasingly hunters, especially rural hunters, are using trail cams to surveil their land here. And <clears throat> there's a, a, a increasing reliance on hunters to use trail cams to identify what kind of game they want to harvest here. And um, they're collecting their own data too through the cameras. And a lot of the scientists, uh, hunters, who are actually hired by state government to manage natural resources come in conflict with trail cam data. So these scientists are saying that, okay, these hunters are not understanding the global patterns of de deer movement. They're only collecting data in their local areas here. So as a result, rural hunters are losing their skills and finding patterns and doing things like pre-scouting because they're depending on cameras. And another side effect of cameras, according to scientist hunters, is that hunters become obsessed with certain deer now. So previously, it'd be more of a spontaneous nature to harvest deers. But here, they'll be tracking big bucks at night on these cameras. And then they'll go the entire season and not shoot a deer because they're waiting for that one animal now. They'll name the deer. And they're almost thinking that those are their animals. They start to feel ownership of those animals, even though oftentimes they come from public land. Right? They see them every day on the camera. So this uh, trail cam is, ch is removing hunters from the land and understanding the animal. So uh, there's actually many different sort of spheres of hunting, if you were, many different social worlds of hunting, and I've only talked about a few of them, but they're often framed, again, in terms of the dialectics, right? So you know, what is the difference between muzzle-loading hunters uh, and rifle hunters, right? So they're talking about why their sort of way of, rec of realizing fair chase is better than other ways. <clears throat> So um, designs often focus on mediating nature. And um, what's kind of interesting here is that actually we see what hunters do is by using technologies, I'm going to call weapons technologies here, they actually are deliberately limiting their capabilities to hunt. right? And the reason they do that, I would argue, is that they're, they're almost like donning different value hats, if you will. They're playing with values. So uh, weapons kind of enable a different sphere of existence with nature, if you will. So, uh, I want to become a hunter that needs to get closer to animals and get closer to uh, have a greater chance of failure because that's a different way of living. But a hunter in the next season might say, okay, I want to do rifle hunting, and that's a different way of doing fair chase. And the hunters often always talk about ideals. So they know fair chase is the gold standard, but they know also that they'll never reach them, right? So there's always some failure in reaching those ideal values. So I think that the rhetorical value of fair chase is, is very important. So there, there must be some ways, I think, to investigate designs that kind of reconcile the rhetorical symbolic function values with their different uh, interpretive practices here. So going back to the design for authenticity framework, um, right now my students are, 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 trying to, uh, are developing a system called Animal Tracker here. And the, the idea here is trying to bridge between scientists, hunters, and rural hunters here. So there's a divide between the two, and um, there, there has been some tension with the state against the rural hunters here. So one way to do this perhaps is to present, for example, a scientist mode of animal tracking. So maybe a public installation that will show how scientists understand global trends of hunting, of deer movements, and rationale for recent announcements for season changes or deer harvesting limits. Right? Whereas uh, the rural hunter mode would help scientists understand you know, why these hunters hold on to their local views of deer activity, what kind of local knowledge might be valuable for scientists hunters, uh, for example, webcam photos of deer tracks. Right? Uh, 
And, and uh, the motivation here is again to increase the empathy between these different ways of living and hunting here. Okay, so now I'd like to just step back and reflect on the work on these two subcultures and indeed sort of all the subcultures uh, my research group is uh, engaging with here. And first, one of the questions that might pop up is, you know, why study subcultures? And I think one of the interesting things is that they sort of envision future possibilities for mainstream society. So, you know, in the 1970s, uh, shoes designed for skateboarding by bands became very emblematic of skater culture, right? And, it, and now these kind of shoes, skater shoes, are really part of mainstream shoe fashion, right? So just because someone wears a shoe that looks like a van shoe, does not mean they're a skater these days. So that, that's in, in the domain of fashion. But here we also see that um, sort of the, some of the feminist movements that are happening now definitely have precedence back in the sort of grassroots or sisterhood movements that happened in the 1970s, right? So groups of women gathered together in these sisterhoods, uh, talk about their experiences with doctors and share their self-knowledge, um, discussion about reproductive rights, lesbian sexuality and sexual independence. And, you know, they created this, uh, um, um, this great sort of pamphlet called Our Bodies, Ourselves that has been hugely impactful. Uh, in women's health, right? And we can see some of that, obviously not all of that, having uh, entered mainstream society here. And subcultures are just a inf very information-rich site for unpacking the role of technology in the identities, practices, and values of people. So, but what I want to point out is, I think, a fundamental problem in trying to design for subcultures which is precisely what their strength is, is that they simultaneously have a very admirable sense of unity, but within the subcultures, there's often much disunity there. So outwardly, they're united by these sets of canonical values. People inside interpret and practice in diverse, sometimes conflicting ways, right? And both of these things, the unified values, and plus the ways they're actually interpreted are continually performed, enacted, and changing, right? And you always have to think about this is always in the context of the mainstream societies in which they're situated in. And technologies are often the sites of where this divisive discourse between how do you realize canonical values happen here. So the sort of research questions I've been kind of grappling with with all these subcultures is what is the role of technology in these canonical values and the enactment of these values? And is there a way to design for both diversity and unity? Because both things are very important to subcultures and gives them their strengths, I think. And as I've thought about how I contribute to these research questions, um, I've often done this by marrying humanistic methods with empirical methods. So I kind of want to turn now to talking a little bit about what it means to actually uh, do this. And uh, uh, Jeff Barzell and Sean Barzell have um, been at the forefront of talking about what does it mean to do humanistic HCI, uh, which is an HCI that deploys humanistic epistemologies uh, in service to HCI. So they argue that we need to build better bridges between humanities and HCI. And obviously, there's been a lot of work out there. Um, and many of you out there have already written work in this style. For example, the critical interpretations of, of empirical data, which can be considered uh, humanistic HCI. <clears throat> so I want to first talk about two cases of marrying humanities and the empirical. So the first case is using humanities itself as a theoretical lens onto practices that are in the humanities. And the second part is thinking about <coughs> humanistic methods as a way to sometimes address deficiencies in empirical methods. So the first case is probably maybe the, the most simple one to understand, I think. So you can see what the user is already doing as in the humanities. So if the site of your study isn't something that has a focus in humanities, so you're studying something about art, music, literature, sports, or the site of study involves processes of interest in humanities, like creativity, critique, skill, uh, this might be a good place to see humanities as a good, good theoretical lens here. So in the case of the study of um, Irish traditional musicians, I found that you know, through grounded theory and thinking about how that analysis sort of intersects with reader reception theory was a useful way to think about how do Irish musicians think about tunes, learn tunes, and retain them. Um, and thinking about why Midwest hunters were always talking about in oppositions to others, the dialectics was an interesting way to think about that. So in the second case, um, I want to talk about how we might look at humanistic methods as ways to kind of address deficiencies of empirical methods, or rather merge them together. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about ethnography a little bit in very broad strokes here. And 
Um, ethnographic methods of inquiry often emphasize that researchers ask questions of how versus why. So Howard Becker talks about the, the notion that the why question is very hard. So if you ask someone why they did something, often the informant feels like they need to express something that is acceptable or everyone else would think is normal here. And as ethnographers, we often also taught that we need to very much elicit concrete events. Um, this is something I, I've been taught and I found very, a very fruitful approach, right? So first you ground questions uh, on concrete details, then you can ask questions about reflection and opinion, right? But only after you ask concrete details. Uh, you don't want informants to start veering into what they think should generally happen day to day. You don't want the informant to theorize for the researcher and you want to gather first-hand accounts here. But increasingly, as my work does intersect with value-sensitive design, I think value-sensitive design is actually pre precisely concerned with questions of why, right? You know, because values are seen often as a reason why people do things, right? That is one way to look at value-sensitive design and, and looking at values, right? So how do you get, how do you ask why questions that will generate the sort of thick description you want that you can do through these you know, these other kinds of techniques to ask questions of how. And um, so, for example, in the question of the Irish traditional musicians with Tune Tracker, I actually found the sphere's existence maybe a better way to think about, despite all the analysis we did, the system building and development, that maybe sometimes turning to philosophy was useful to understand, you know, why did the system fail? You know, what are, what are the different ways of thinking about the, the ethnographic field work that I had out here. And I'd like to just show very uh, quickly about some current work that uses humanistic methods early on in the data collection process here. And this is a method that we call futuristic autobiographies uh, that uses humanistic methods in semi-structured interviews. So the, the reason this came about is that we had a need to expeditiously elicit rich discussion about values from well-known roboticists. So this was a study about understanding how the values of roboticists influence their designs here. So the basic idea here is you present the roboticist with a prompt that is a plausible story about that informant right, in the future, but it has some ambiguous and open-ended aspects to it. And then the informant has to think about what event led to that futuristic autobiography. Why did that bi how did that biography come out to be of that informant? So the robotics comes up with this fictional narrative, and of course the main character is the informant themselves in this interview uh, prompt here. So just to give an example, one of the things we're interested in is in what are the technological expectations that robotics have? What are the assumptions they make? So we made this futuristic uh, autobiography prompt here. So in 2026, you're writing a day log of your research, you conduct an exper uh, a user experiment with your robot, and then in one moment during the experiment, you had experience that gave you goosebumps, right? And it caused you to cry out in surprise. What did you write in your log today, right? And so the informant has to explain what was written in that log. And so if we draw parallels to what happens in a semi-structured interview, again, we want to kind of get at sort of deep uh, reflection and data on um, values here. And so the, uh, we present the futuristic autobiography, and then the informant can talk about how that futuristic autobiography came about, right? So that's almost like the how question. How did that happen there? And then they can reflect on that how through normal techniques and semi-structured interviews to get at the questions of why here, right? So the hope here is that by doing this, we can get a much more detailed account of explaining about values and why they're doing things, but it's still grounded in a concrete future event that they've created here. So we found this technique to be useful. So um, in our HRI and CSCW paper, we talk about you know, uh, how robosis, even HRI type robots or hu the design humanoids, actually think that the ideal robots are utilitarian and they emphasize values like physical safety. And they actually think that uh, users that form strong attachments to robots or expect robots to have emotions are naive and expect in the future these naive robots will become what they call sensible users. Right? They'll uh, adapt to robots' limitations, uh, they'll speak like a robot and learn to program basically. Okay, so I've given a lot of examples of where I blended the two together, and, uh, but I don't want to say that it's easy to do the humanities and the empirical together, and there's a lot of discussion in this space. So I'm going to talk about, a little bit about these challenges. Um, 
one thing is sometimes grounded theory is actually uh, directly opposed to the uh, ways of doing humanities, actually, right? So if you think about very simplistically, grounded theory is something about finding patterns, right? It's still about coding, finding patterns across these codes and, looking, and, and thinking about these patterns. But in humanities often celebrates individuality, the expert opinion, right? And it's not always concerned about things like sampling or representation here, right? So for example, it doesn't make sense to find patterns of interpretation around text. Does it make sense to collect data with the humanities? Maybe not necessarily so, right? And so you risk drowning the individual voice here. So I think Ron Tomatoes kind of illustrates this tension a little bit that you can see the individual voices of the critics. And so maybe you're a person that liked Roger Ebert's uh, critique, so you always looked at his reviews, but you're not so worried about whether his reviews are a representative sample of reviews, right? That's not what you're thinking. But the tomato meter is some way to represent that uh, you know, patterns of reviews in some ways, right? So I think it, it illustrates that tension a little bit. Another thing is that many people, if you ask the users to do humanistic exercises, like the futuristic autobiography, many of them are very reluctant to do that, right? So they're self-conscious about creating, you know, I'm not good at writing stories, you know, I don't want you to like uh, critique it. Uh, so we need to find techniques to inspire confidence and comfort about this. And I think this is analogous to the same challenges many of you may be faced when doing something like participatory design or code design. Um, as writers, uh, so as researchers writing up things that incorporate humanities, you know, I face challenges in doing this as well. So sometimes you know, you're going to need to devote space to explaining concepts from the humanities. And you don't want to do it in such a way that it makes it, uh, you know, your work like a jack of all trades and only doing a very surface look into <coughs> humanities, right? So how do you show the value of this work to the research community? And it's not always clear cut how humanities and empirical were used. So uh, uh, Shawin, uh, Jeff, and Amanda Lazar and I did uh, some research on the menopause subreddit. And when we did this sort of uh, close reading and content analysis of the data, we said that we were informed by feminist sensibilities, right? That was kind of some of the text we used. But is that going to be enough, right? You can imagine some of you are saying, what does a feminist sensibility mean, right? I want you to spell out exactly how did the feminist framework help you out here, right? But that might not be the right way for humanists to think about that. And that might be enough to say it there. So we need some refinement on you know, effectively conveying the use of blend of humanities and empirical. And I think from the reviewer's perspectives, how do you evaluate whether work blends humanities and empirical is something to think about as well. So I would say nowadays, the humanistic essay, um, as a Barzell's called, so these kind of position or challenging pieces or agenda setting pieces are, are now more accepted, right? So you can submit these kind of essay kind of formats to Kai, for example, and people are not going to evaluate it on things like representation, right? They're going to look at, you know, the voice, you know, do you have a purpose and a good position that's laid out? But um, if you're doing a work that is blending both humanities and empirical, and they're on equal footing, I think it's very likely the reviewer is going to try to review it on a criteria of empirical work or, the empir or humanities work, right? But what does it mean if they're both being used at the same time? So I think it's unclear to say, how do you evaluate it when they're both, you know, you're creating something new out of two, essentially. So how do you evaluate that? Okay, so um, sort of ongoing and future work. Um, one of the, the works that we're really excited about is, is thinking about, again, treating users as humanistic experts. And one of the things we're doing is trying to understand web design as sort of art objects, right? So just like you have... Uh, paintings from Baroque period or Impressionist period, you know, can you have uh, users talk about why web designs belong to different periods of web design, right? And so that's some uh, work we're doing there. Another thing is trying to combine computational social science with humanistic concepts. So we've been drawing from feminist philosophy here and trying to use that to help us basically operationalize what does it mean to do objectification in language. So we did a study on Twitch streamers, female and male, and analyze their chats to identify you know, what are the different languages they're using. So um, as you might expect, when it's a female streamer, uh, there's a lot more language that are talking about the female streamer's uh, appearance rather than her skill with the game. And uh, so I was recently awarded an NSF Career Award, and that's going to go towards trying to apply and actually test this designing for authenticity framework. 
to bridge uh, between the urban and rural and subcultures here. And so one thing we're very interested in is in actually in farmers markets what happens. So I think a farmers market is a very interesting place when you have rural and uh, urban cultures kind of clashing together here. And uh, so when you go to a farmers market, you know, maybe many of you don't really care about the process of how your thing was grown. You just care that it was organic and maybe ethically raised, right? But you don't want to know the details. So the farmers will actually deliberately uh, be selectively transparent about maybe how hard it is to become a small farmer and how hard it is to grow things organically, right? But some small farmers, uh, we've talked to talk about that, for certain people that really want to engage and understand sustainability, they'll reveal more details. So are there ways to design systems for that selective transparency? Um, and we're doing a, a Kai uh, workshop, actually exploring the intersection of philosophy and HCI. Um, so uh, the position papers will be up there pretty soon, but I encourage you to kind of take a look at that to see what people have been kind of thinking about in that domain. And uh, you know, like most research that many of us do, it's not a solitary endeavor, so I really want to just acknowledge all my uh, students and uh, collaborators here um, who have made this work uh, possible here. So um, these are kind of the, the main points here, and I'm happy to take any questions here. Thank you. Cultures. Uh, it sounds like a lot of the technology that you've been thinking about is, in a way, like trying to overcome this idea of gatekeeping, which the the community seem to have. Like the community yeah. seem to enjoy that their practice is challenging in a lot of respects. And so, like, is 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 am, am I totally off base, or is that a, a tension that you you see where? Like, in a sense, your design is making some of the things which make their subculture so hard to get into easier, and that's part of the challenge there. Yeah, um, I mean, that's definitely the challenge. I think um, it definitely comes from the inherent characteristic of subcultures that often, I think, when people do ethnographies of those kind of subcultures, you know, you might go through gatekeepers, for example, as initial contacts there, right? And um, those sort of gatekeepers are the ones uh, that often hold to the most conservative values of the subculture, right? So, um, and and they often repeat that kind of trope of like, you know, back in my day, you had to do it kind of tough, and you know, you're gonna have everyone do it the same way, right? So, um, so I, I do agree. The part of the challenge is thinking about um, when is it too easy to some aspect, right? That even maybe the amateur musicians would not like that. But I think it's also having the amateur musicians in this, in this subculture <coughs> to understand why is it that these <coughs> professional musicians feel so strongly about that, right? What is to be gained to, you know, by toughing it out, right? And so, for example, one way, you know, one reason to tough it out is because it forces you to listen to um, maybe more uh, older masters playing the music, right? So if you don't do that, then maybe you won't get your own distinct style, right? So I think maybe understanding that motivation might be a, a, bit, a way to kind of get past beyond the whole like nostalgia kind of trope or just like this is the tough way, you know, this is the way I did it, walked in five miles of snow kind of thing, right? I think, I think we need to go beyond that, which is an easy thing to get stuck in with subcultures. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question, and it's um, because when Reader Response first came into existence right. in the early 1990s, one of the first questions that it asked was, what's your, what's your audience? So, um, and when you do ethnography, mm -hmm. your audience really, or your primary audience, are the people themselves. I mean, so that it's the way in which the musicians or the hunters, in other words, they are the people that you're writing for in the first place. Mm. Um, and then that's sometimes simplified under a rubric that's called the native point of view. That your goal is to portray what it is that the people that are engaged in these activities are actually doing. Right. So that's a very simplistic, it's not entirely correct. Right. But the, so the audience I'm asking about is what is your audience? In other words, that your audience is clearly 
not those people, um, particularly with the hunters. Um, it's only partially those people, given the fact that you are, in fact, a participant <coughs> in the Irish music. Right. So who are you writing for? Who are you producing this information for? And what is, you know, in other words, what is their interest in this particular material? So you're writing for an audience, but I don't really understand what audience you're writing for. Right. Um, okay, so the, the notion of audience here, I guess I would think about is um, that the ethnographic field work and, and the writing there is to, um, to think about you know, ways to inform or engage with design, right? And, and the hope there is that the design event is, is meant to engage with, with the, the people that I'm engaging with in these subcultures, right? So through the designs themselves, they're meant to sort of communicate ways in which you think, you know, hopefully will improve the lives of these subcultures, right, of the people there. But, you know, I do sort of acknowledge, right, it, it is a large, large part, you know, the researchers' voices in there too, right? So it's not just, you know, I'm not claiming that the ethnographies that I write are uh, straight representations of the truth or that they uh, totally accurately capture the practice and values of these subcultures, right? There's something inside, you know, that I have to reflect on myself, and it's my own voice there um, um, thinking about, you know, what are the things that need to be teased out and it might be useful in a design sense, right? So I think the, the audience there, you know, is to inform designers, right? And often it's often to inform designs that will benefit the subcultures I'm studying. So, in other words, if I may follow up, um, so what you're saying is that you are, you have some kind of an outsider's notion of what constitutes a benefit for these communities, and what you're trying to do is to create that social policy uh, or policy-oriented goals to fit the particular group that you're studying. Is that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, um, I would hope that, you know, I, I'm, I'm always going to be, in some sense, an outsider, but I would hope that, um, you know, by trying to engage in a sensitive manner and reflectively thinking about my own biases and ways that, that, that mo my voice is intersecting with these ethnographies, that despite the fact that's an outsider perspective, you know, it's, it's done in a way that's uh, respectful of my engagement with these communities and hopefully you know, the, the hope is that that will lead to these sort of more sensitive sort of designs for these communities, right? So not just merely from outside perspective sort of prescribing technology or thinking that this is the best way. It's still informed, but you know, it's still going to be, you know, no endeavor is going to be perfect, right? But the hope is that by being informed by close engagement or maybe doing something like co-design with these communities, that uh, these designs will be, you know, a, a better fit for them or, or benefit for them. I had a question about the tune tracker kind of specifically. Sure. Um, so I noticed that the key signatures were listed for the songs, and I'm, I mean, uh, like these songs could be played in any keys, and I was wondering if those keys represented the transcriptions of the songs, or if those were for the actual performances. Yeah. Actually, Irish traditional music is actually played on a relatively limited set of keys. So for example, I played a flute, and its, its home key is really D major, mm -hmm. and like um, you can very add a few more keys and flats to it, but once you get farther than that, it gets really hard to play on the Irish flute. So actually, the, the keys there would be the typical key, actual key the piece would be played in. Okay. Right. So um, very, sometimes you have a tune that's often played in two different keys, but I would say that's a little rarer. Usually the tune is played in a specific key, and it's that key that's listed there. Okay, that was my follow-up yeah. question, because then I guess I would wonder about the uh, the aesthetic performer, the aesthetic musician, and whether or not if they're pulling from this and they learn this song in this specific key, whether or not like that would be the common practice, or if they're developing assumptions that may misrepresent the sort of yeah, I would, yeah, I would say um, I mean if they learn from that system, um, sometimes they're played in keys that are like off by one difference, right? So that that definitely does does happen. It would be an assumption to make that that is the key. But I would say, um, you know, most pieces often have a key that is strongly associated with it. So you might not be too bad if you try to learn 
at least the key from an online source, for example. Cool. Yeah. All right. I think we should. Okay. All right. <coughs> we can be downstairs where there's refreshments, and you can ask more questions. Yes, please ask more questions. Thank you. Thank you.